Welcome to the Business Owner Elevation Podcast, the show that's designed for coaches, consultants, and expert business owners that are looking to achieve higher levels of productivity and profitability, where we share battle-tested tactics and innovative ideas that guarantee to elevate your business rapidly. Brought to you from the award-winning Best UK Business Podcast in 2015. Without further ado, here's your hosts, Robert Dean Smith and Leon Street. Hello and welcome guys, it's Leon Street here alongside my co-host, Mr. Robert Dean Smith the first. Absolutely, now we're bringing you another exciting episode of Business Owner Elevation Podcast slash TV. Yeah. Now we've got a great guest in store for you and I'm going to welcome to the show Dwayne Henry first of all. How are you doing Thank Dwayne? You How are you doing bro? I'm good. I'm good. Awesome. Yeah. So we're going to reveal a bit more about Dwayne shortly because he's royalty. I'm going to explain a bit more in a moment about that. I don't want to embarrass him too much. But what I want to do is hand over to Rob because I just want a bit of a backstory just for our audience so okay. they know where, where we come from and then we can introduce Dwayne. That's properly. phenomenal. Elevation yeah. Nation. So the backstory, I mean... I, I first met Dwayne, gosh, whew, I don't even know how old he is now, if you're 30, are you 32, 33? Yeah. So it probably would have been about 15, yeah. 16. Yeah. How that came about is basically, uh, there was myself and a few other guys, maybe about 15 guys that was in an organization called 100 Black Men, and that's a mentoring organization, an international mentoring organization that was founded in America. And then the first international chapter was here in Birmingham. And my good friend, uh, Carl George, who we've also had on the show before on a podcast show. If you want to go back to episode 003 or 4, you can check that interview out. Basically started that movement here in the UK. And it, what it was is basically dealing with or helping youth, especially black youth, um, rise their aspirations. So we were going into schools and we were doing events and we used to have a once a month thing down at um, the drum. And we we just do these like mentoring sessions with people, with the young people. And there was like, I don't know, sometimes it'd be 50, 60 mixture of boys and girls. And obviously Dwayne was one of those candidates who used to show up regularly, had a rice smile, still got that smile, I think. <laughs> but he had this goal, like many, many of many of the guys that were going to the sessions, they all had different goals and ambitions. But I, I distinctly remember Dwayne's being like, I want to be in Hollywood. And like, I, I, maybe there was a few eyebrows raised, but I was like... In my head, it's like, wow, that's good. Like, for me, the sky is the limit or the unit would be under the sky's limit. So, like, we were just encouraging people to do what they want to do, what their goals were. And obviously, over that time, we've seen the meteoric rise of Dwayne Henry and some of you will know him as Clayton Reeves, Mr. Clayton Reeves. <laughs> um, you know, going through what it takes to be an actor. And it's not easy, like, acting, any business, anything you want to do, your whole career, there's levels, there's challenges. And today we're going to be very fortunate to really step into Dwayne world. I'm, I'm, I'm excited that he's given us that opportunity to step into his world and, and share. And I think this is going to help not only our audience, but I'm even thinking about my daughter who's 15 now and my son who's 18, how this will probably influence them and probably Absolutely. give them some ideas on, like, the sky is the limit and there are going to be challenges. Nothing's going to be an easy step-by-step -step process. So I'm, I'm really delighted and, uh, boy, words can't explain how I'm yeah. feeling right now. Cool. So I just really want to jump in. Yeah, yeah, we're going to jump in. So, guys, as I said, royalty, Hollywood royalty. So I believe the, the main show that people know him from, the, the name Clayton Reeves at the moment, is from a show called NCIS. Is that right? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Cool, <laughs> yeah. cool. Yeah. We just want to make sure we don't get <laughs> No retakes on yeah. this episode. <laughs> we're going straight in, guys. Yeah. So... As I said, we're bringing somebody from Birmingham originally, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Brum, brum, Birmingham, Birmingham, I'm in the house. And yeah. the key thing, and I'll put this across, it's, it's kind of like, this is, it's my thing. I'm, I'm being a bit kind of me, me, me. But I want to give you guys a great episode to show you what somebody, you know, where, when they're influenced the right way, but more importantly, they then put their mind to a goal. Mm. They make it happen. So whether it's business, whether it's a challenge you've got going on right now, it doesn't matter. And, and that's the reason why we have Dwayne on today. So what I'd love, first of all, just to jump in, do you, should we get a bit of a background from Dwayne so we can just share with yeah, people? Yeah? yeah, And then we can just dive in. So what I'd love, Dwayne, is for you to kind of take us back to around that time that Rob's talking about, okay. you know, were you like 15 or so? Yeah. And then we can just bring it right back, fast forward in probably like five minutes or so. Okay. Well, yeah. first off, thank you for that introduction. Yeah. That, yeah. Was, that was cool, man. <laughs> I'm sitting there like, right, is that me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. It means a lot, man. Um, so... 100 black men. Yeah. 15 years old, Oxhill Road, St. John Wall School. Teachers called us in, saying we have some guests coming in. 
from the community and I just remember going in with uh, all the man them. Yeah. A few of us, you know, we didn't know what to expect. Uh, looking out the window, seeing a bunch of black cars pull up. I remember it like it was yesterday. <laughs> Shiny black cars. And I'm like, what's this? Some men in black business. Like, yeah. Who are yeah. these guys? Uh, long story short, a uh, bunch of well-dressed gentlemen walk in our uh, classroom and stand at the front of us, you know, a couple gold teeth shining here. And <laughs> but also a tie as well. Yeah, so yeah. I'm just like, okay, who are these guys? And then I just started talking about, you know, the foundation of, the, the basis of their, their sort of uh, group mm-hmm. their group is mm-hmm. and it was 100 black men I remember hearing the name 100 black men and as soon as I heard it it just it's like a punch you know it, it's quite powerful you know, yeah. 100 black men it's like what why 100 like what's this about yeah. so that was my very first ever uh, introduction to these guys world yeah. you know so um, yeah I remember Carl George just standing up at the front and he just had this aura about him and his just success was beaming off him. And <laughs> I was looking around at my boys like, you're catching this. I'm trying to play it down like it's not. I'm looking at him like, well, it looks like a superhero, man. Yeah. These guys do. Like, what is the deal with them? Mm-hmm. And then uh, that was the first day, the uh, rest of my life, you know, in terms of um, what um, 100 Black Men uh, did for me. It just That was the first sort of ray of sort of light coming out. Because mm. before that, obviously growing up, you know, limited support from the male figures yeah, in my life. Yeah, yeah. I never had that, you know. Mm-hmm. I never seen man in suits. I see man in suit, they're on the way to court. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I never, I never really seen that type mm-hmm. of uh, thing. So that was the very first ever introduction of a hundred black men, and they screamed success at me. And I didn't know what I, I knew. I wanted to act kind of a little bit. I knew it came natural to me. I knew I wanted to do something different, but I didn't know what. I didn't marry the two feelings together. Mm-hmm. But I remember uh, sticking by Carl, and and uh, I remember just hearing every word that came mm-hmm. out of their mouth. I'm thinking. I want to. I want to continue this. So at the end, they gave out a few leaflets and stuff, yeah. and then I remember just hitting him up. I don't, I don't remember exactly, but I remember just sticking to him and just, as you said, going down to the drum mm-hmm. and starting to get involved in an organization called Junior One Hundred, and I wanted to be a part of that. That's when I first started to realize what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, and um, that was one of the first times I met David Harewood as yeah. well, and he was a god at that point because he'd done like a show called Fat Friends, The Vice. You know, I used to watch all these yeah. guys, and I knew he was black and he was from Birmingham, and he was. Small from not from Hansa, just sort of small heath, yeah, yeah, but it right. meant a lot that he was a stone's throw uh, from where I'm from. Mm-hmm. So that was literally the first instruction I had with um, you know, 100 black men and sort of a uh, hierarchy of what I wanted to do with my life. Yeah, that was it. Very first, awesome, story. awesome. Yeah. So, so where did you go from that point? So, you were in the, the, the program 100 black men. Like and then you mentioned obviously um, this star from the Vice and so on. Yeah. Where where did your journey take you next? Because uh, I, I, and just before you answer, the yeah. reason why I ask is because at fifteen, that's mm. quite a lofty goal to say. Mm, yeah. yeah. I, I think I'd like to be an actor. That's something different. And I'm I'm just trying to bridge the gap to where you are now, yeah. which is like it, in the reality, in the big scheme of things, a lot of people who go down the route yeah. that you do and then and they don't make it. Yeah. 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 And for for one reason or another, you've got this. I'd I'd like to know what's the next steps that happen then. Um, well, I think like most fifteen year olds, you're drunk with audacity, you know. Mm-hmm. And I was anyway. But I didn't know where it was going to take me. It can take you to the roads. It can take you here. It can take yeah. you there. But that audacity doesn't leave you. Mm-hmm. You carry with it. You know, especially mm-hmm. where we're from. You have this stigma, so we have this cloak around us, this front, this ego, yeah, this, yeah. you know, uh, whatever it is, you know, to protect us. Because people say to me, like, who raised you? Like, what has it? And it was the man then. Yeah. I took elements from my boys, good mm. and bad. Mm. They raised me. I didn't I didn't know, you know, TV, film, music. They raised me. I didn't mm. have, like, a, you know, a, a structured father figure in my life. Mm. My mom, you know, had me very young, very, very young. Yeah. So she had to sort of figure it out. And, you know, she was, we was figuring it out with her, yeah. you know, yeah. so... Yeah. At that time, I knew early enough that if I wanted to do something different, I'm going to have to do something I've never done. Yeah. First and foremost, you yeah. can't do something you've done and get a different result. It's yeah. not going to happen. Yeah. It's physically impossible. So I knew that. So after school, 15, 16, I went to Dudley College. And I went to Dudley College because I wanted to get out of the ends. I okay. thought it was the only way I'm going to have to break out of this sort of um, comfort zone, yeah. so to speak, yeah, where yeah. everything is just easy, easily accessible to me you know, what I've got around me. So I thought, okay, go to a college outside of the ends, but not too far. And I liked the course as well. But admittedly, I didn't take the first year too serious. I was still focusing on just being fresh out of school, mm, yeah. looking at hair, makeup girls upstairs, <laughs> yeah. just, you know, being out of the of ends, course. you know. So I was yeah, like, oh, yeah. right. So the first year, I didn't really take my performing arts uh, serious. And then uh, three of my teachers, Lynn Miller, Dave Morris and Dave Wilson, I remember at different times, but not in so many words, They'd sit me down, you know, screaming at me. Yeah. I remember Dave Wilson pulling me to the side and saying, you could be an actor, like actual 
you could be someone. Mm-hmm. Like, you've got this raw talent. And I'd be like, really, sir? You reckon I could do it? Though? <laughs> and it'd be like, if you stop peeing around yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. screwing around and showing off and trying to impress girls and all these stupidness and focus, you could actually do something. And he mm-hmm. gave me a piece uh, by Hamlet. A piece of Hamlet. I forget what it's called. It's two, two solid flesh with melt and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And it was a scene, a three-minute scene I did in front of the whole uh, year. Yeah. And... Um, I think it impressed a lot of people where they thought, okay, this kid maybe can, can do something. That was one of the first things ever. It was nothing serious, yeah. but it was a piece. And then from then, well, before that, I always had, I used to tell my mom, I have this, I just, I remember driving my mom through Nietzsche's one day. I never forget it. And I was like, mom, I keep getting this feeling in myself here, yeah, but I don't know what it is, but it just feels like I, I couldn't figure it out at the time, but it was a purpose. It was a yeah, calling, yeah, you know? Yeah, and I didn't know at the yeah. time, I was like, mom, I feel this thing and I can't stop thinking about it. And it's just, Calling me, I think about day and night, but I don't know what it is. She'd be like, Well, what is it then, son? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? And I'm like, I don't know. It just feels <laughs> it feels nuts. Yeah. And obviously I loved acting. And obviously I just thought marry the two feelings together. Mm. Maybe it's that, you know, and then and then run with it. So long story short, I did my two years at Dudley College and then I made a plan to mm. go to London for ten years. A plan. A plan. Yeah, yeah, I made a plan. I, I, I figured out, you know, no matter what happens. You know, arm, leg, chop off, teeth, mm-hmm. drop out. You do 10 years in London. 10 years. And then you go to States and see what you can do. I thought, you've got nothing to lose. So where, where, where did the, the, the awareness mm-hmm. come from to know that? Andrew that, Blackman. Uh, they told me you have a two-year plan, five-year plan, plan, ten-year plan. And, and this, is, this is partly why, like, the, the transformation part is so important for yeah. me. And I, I don't want to interrupt no, you no, for no, too much. But having a mentor or somebody who can... S- help you to see the angles that you're not seeing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because what you don't see, you don't know. Yeah. So please carry yeah. on. So 27th of November 2003, it was a Thursday, half six in the evening. My best friend, Crab, Crabba Crabba, he dropped me off to New Street Station and I went to London. I uh, stayed on my auntie's couch for a year just to learn the logistics of mm-hmm. London, get the smell mm-hmm. of it, the feel. Walked into my first job, uh, Clark's on Oxford Street, you know, no CV. I had this bravado about me. They were like, you need a CV? I was like, I ain't got one, but face-to-face is the best way of communication. He's like, come in tomorrow for an interview. <laughs> Week later, I was working. You know, it took them a few months to sack me and figure out that I was a bag of air. You know, <laughs> but I just needed the job. You know, mm. and the second job was a, a, a cinema in uh, Leicester Square, mm. and they also fired me because they caught me. You know, daydreaming and just practicing my whole graph. The press, mm. the manager called me one day and was like, "I can see you on the camera pressing feed on the till and all these papers coming out, and you're just writing on it. What are you doing?" But I was practicing my autograph. Yeah. Literally, I was just, oh, how am I going to get this way? It's just natural. <laughs> and then they fired me because they were like, you're just daydreaming. So I figured, mm. you know, but that was it, you know, that was the start of it. And then I got an agent a year later and mm-hmm. started doing a lot of TV and film over the next 10 years to, to make it go short. Just, you know, Doctor Who, Doctors, Casualty, all the TV shows you can think of, I did, you know, and it was a very, very beautiful experience. It's sharp on my tools, yeah. and my works, you know, yeah. and I own my skills. I'd be on sets and asking, what does this do? What does that do? My friends went to uni. I didn't do that. So yeah. that was my learning. That yeah. was my... True. On the job. Yeah. yeah. So 10 years, you know, a couple of years before, like eight years, it started to dry up. Yeah. And I started to realise, like, okay, D, be realistic. You're not going to make it in London. There's too much man down here. You're already an outsider yeah. and blah, blah, blah. So I thought, okay... You know, and then uh, 27th of November, 2013, I booked my flight to LA. Why well, didn't someone booked it for me? <laughs> yeah. And 3rd of December, I was in the States. Yeah. And then when I got there, obviously, once again, I was homeless. I just had like $300, a suitcase, that same audacity I had when I was young. And I just ran with it. You know, I took a year out when I first got there. I didn't want to touch a sniff a script. I just wanted to get uh, logistics, learning to drive on the other side, work on the American accent, yeah. tone up a little bit, and just get a feel for the States because ultimately it's where actors come to die. So I was ready mm. for whatever. I was mm. like, yeah, I yeah. nothing to lose. This is my home now. And then after a year, I got an agent. Well, I met an agent when I first got out there, and he was like, he sat me down, he was like, are you ready to do this? And I went, no. <laughs> and I was, no. I said, yeah. I'm not. And he said, okay. A year later, he got a call and I said, I'm ready. And he was like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, I'm ready. Because everyone was waiting that whole year for me to pull a rabbit out of the hat. Mm. They were like, can you act though? Like, what are you doing out here? <laughs> like, you did dub play. What's that? What's dub play drama? We don't know what that is out here. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, all these things. So I was like, all right, cool. And my first audition, um, well, before that, he sent me a pilot, a, sh- a show called Billions. It's a big show. Yeah, yeah, it's a, no, yeah. I've, I've never it. seen it. But he sent me a scene from that show. And he was a hotshot lawyer. And he said, all right, do this scene for me and send it to me. I did it. I got my um, partner at the time to film it and, you know, hot shot lawyer mm-hmm. scene. And I sent it to him. About an hour later, he called me, he texted me back and said, okay, I've got an audition for a show called Shades of Blue with Jennifer Lopez, a new TV series. 
And that was my first audition in America. And long story short, it was out me and another guy for that show. I had three meetings. Top of the NBC Tower was Jennifer Lopez, Barry Medina, Barry, um, Benny Medina, and mm-hmm. Barry Levinson, the director of Raymond. And then j was just like, this is your first audition in America? And I was like, <laughs> yeah. It's just like, oh my God, you're first? I was like, yeah, it's my first audition. Another kid got it, obviously the guy's mm-hmm. playing it, but I just think I was maybe a little bit nervous or just yeah, wasn't ready, yeah, yeah, didn't yeah, have the yeah. experience. Mm-hmm. But from then, Obviously, I got close with a bunch of stuff after that. But from that first one, they were like, okay, this kid might can act. He just needed the right gig. Mm. So from then, you know, I didn't get nothing that year. But the next year, I booked a pilot called Paradise Pictures. It was set in the 40s, American, Mm. Deep South. And I beat out a lot of American boys for it, you know. I beat out all of them for it. Uh, I got that. I played a young saxophone uh, player. And, you know, I learned to play the sax as well because they gave me a sax for Mm. a few months. So I got handy with that. That pilot didn't get picked up went quiet again at this point I'm homeless you know I've got yeah. no money no nothing mm. just rolling stone crashing here and there but I've been used to that being from where we're from mm. you know you learn to run before you can walk and you just get on with it yeah. you know you're not dead as my mum says yeah. just get on with it and then you know my third year the third third year third year and the pilot season January to uh, March and obviously pilot season is where all the actors come and showcase and they just get put on this carousel where they just try and promote you and get you, you know, right mm. gig to fit. And all pilot season, I got nothing. Oh, from January to right to the end of March, it was dead. I booked a show called Cool Intentions, actually. Mm-hmm. It was a series regular, but they dropped me to reoccurring, which means you just get even lower okay. money and mm. you're not really in it. But that was a blessing because when they dropped me to reoccurring, mm-hmm. I got an opportunity to meet for a show called NCIS. Right. Mm-hmm. So... Obviously, when I first heard of NCIS, you know, obviously, I didn't realise how big it was. I knew it was big, but I didn't know it was, like, mm. number one drama in the world yeah. and all this. I didn't really... Yeah, you were saying that when you were know, yeah. I didn't really care, because that's none of my business. <laughs> you know, I'm here to do a job and yeah. act and, you know, portray characters. So, the numbers is just politics to me, you know. And then, my thought process going into my meeting was, all my friends had booked, you know, my close friend Bashi, Ashley Thomas, you know, we, we hang out a lot in the States. He booked a show called 24 Legacy. I had other friends who booked this show, that show, and I thought, okay... I might can get this because I'm the best of a bad bunch. This was my mentality. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, I have to get this because all the men them have booked. So all the guys going up for this, I can see them in the room. They're all Americans doing a British accent. Yeah. I was like, nah, because you've got to get this. If you don't get this job, yeah. <laughs> that was my thought going into it. So I had three or four meetings with them and they brought me on as a guest for two mm-hmm. episodes. And yeah. Then, yeah. And then did the two episodes. I came home to England mm-hmm. last mm-hmm. summer. Even when I was here last summer and I was hype about me doing the two episodes, I never got the series regular yet, but I didn't tell yeah, anyone. Yeah, yeah. Everyone assumed I was in it, but I never got the green light. So I came home literally to, uh, I was here, I didn't have no money because the two episodes didn't really pay a lot. Mm-hmm. So I was broke back home. Everyone thought I was this and that. Yeah. Boy, I had nothing, but I just held it down, was humble, mm-hmm. still did what I did with the kids because my main focus is just the children and sculpting the future yeah, and yeah, showing yeah. them. I'm from where you're from. You can have what I got. You know, there's no excuse. I don't want to hear it. I don't hear nothing from none of you. Mm. You know, because I am you. You are me. Yeah. You know, so. And then right at the end of my trip in England, I was literally staying at a friend's house by Heathrow in London, ready to go back to America where mm-hmm. I had no job, no yard, no car, no money, nothing. Just that same audacity and drive and, you know, balls, so to speak. Yeah. You know? and, mm. and literally that morning I was getting on the plane. My manager texts me and it just said, green light. <laughs> and then boom my whole world changed and that moment I also wish most people I wish everyone in the world could feel what I felt at that time when it just mm. said green light because I knew my whole life had changed at that second from zero to hundred to no mm. money to more money than I know what to do I knew it was, I knew it was all going to come everything mm. in droves and I knew it because that was it and then that was it Pretty Sick. much. <laughs> what a story, guys. What a story. <laughs> now, I'm yeah. happy you took us mm. on that kind of narrative as well yeah. because it, even I was drawn into mm. what was going on. Mm. And I, I think there's so many different things that come into play, but I want, I want to bring Rob in because I know he, he's a very analytical yeah. thing. No, no, no. <laughs> you know what? I know he, he's taking this in as well. No, no, no I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm so clear. I'm so clear. I'm so clear. Because I just, you know, I, where I want to go, I think, is, is the mentality because... You said it so many times in that in, in, in that probably five, eight minutes, probably longer, like no money, homeless, like tell me the process through the day, like what what kept you going? What were the little things? Because obviously you must have a little routine in your head yeah. that just keeps you like the end result. Your end result was my motivation. The end, end result. result. The end result. Carl George always told me one of the first times I met him, he sat me down and he said, Dwayne, close your eyes and vision where you want to be. 
And I visioned literally to a point where it was real. And it, I kept my eyes closed for a few minutes. And I remember mm. saying to me, what do you see? What does it smell like? How does it feel? Mm. And I was picturing myself just there, red carpet, billboards, people going crazy, whatever. And I opened my eyes and he says, just work yourself to that. Just rewind from that, that moment there, mm. backtrack till now. And that's what I did. I just kept mm. picturing the end result with my motivation. You know, it was the only thing that drove me was the end result. There was no certainties, but... I didn't care. I literally yeah. didn't care. I knew it was, I know it sounds a bit dramatic, but I'd always say I would die for this because mm. I would. I didn't yeah. care. I would, have, I would have died for it, mm. literally, because it's what I live for. And acting, as I said, is, a, is a, my talent is a gift, you know, to have mm. compassion and portray on camera is a gift that I think has been given to me. So I want to open it, look at it, and show everyone and give it away and let people use it and yeah. just feed whoever soul, you know, and spark whichever brain, you know, and if it sparks one brain, all you need is one spark for fireworks, mm. as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Boss of the place, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Boss of the place. That's it, man. You know what, yeah. like, there, there's so much more going on behind the surface and, and below the surface as what Dwayne has explained and, and, and really where Rob just came from, because I, I can feel it as well. Mm. Because yeah, to, to, to be able to... I'm going to go back to Carl George and at some point, Adam, I want you to edit on Carl George's face and we're going to point you to the link to the episode we recorded with Carl because he's a great guy, actually. And more to the point, he helped out with a charity that I helped recently okay. doing some of his governance work as well. So a really great guy. But the, the point I want to get to is that in order to maintain focus on the end goal, mm. no matter what, with no money, no place to live, no car, just mm. your bag. That's one thing, because just before we came on to the interview today, I was sharing a story to our audience on Facebook, and I was talking about a conversation I had with a business owner, and he'd done really well, like 10 years ago, got to seven figures in his business, and things have slipped back a bit, and there's, you know, there's a few things going on, and we got to the bottom of it, and it, it went from being a conversation of just friends to, right, I need to really help this person to get to understand that they're the root of all what's going on. Mm. Yeah, I won't say a problem, it's like what, whatever's going on now. Mm, yeah. And so we spoke about it and what I got to was like, you need to understand that you're holding yourself back and the, you, even your language, the stories that you're saying, whether you believe what you say is one word or a phrase, that's a story you're telling yourself. And if you say, I can't do this because I need to do that or this happens because of that. Mm. What you're actually saying is that I'm putting off my dreams and my goals, the end goal. And and for me to have that level of vigor, the level of tenacity, mm. the the ferociousness to go after it, whether it comes across aggressively, it doesn't matter, but to keep that inside mm -hmm. and then hit where you've got to. Mm. For me, that's so powerful in the transformation process, but more importantly, to have that as a, an underlying skill for yeah. everything you've done, Dwayne. Yeah. Because for me, there's, there's so many people out there that, you know, they, they, they want to go after this big thing to become an actor. For me, like I look at it and think, wow, that's an amazing thing. Do you know what I mean? And it, and it is one of those things where it's lauded with praise, the press, like you said, the billboards, the red carpet. It's that, that kind of like amazing thing that people, you know, when you go to a movie and you watch it, it's all of that. Yeah. And for me, it's an amazing thing to see where you've come from and yet keep pushing when there's like a penny in your bank. Yeah. There's, there's nothing really for you to, to go off, but there is this, guys. Mm. Creativity and energy, which you are not limited to in life. You are not limited. And for me, mm -hmm. that that's, that's my fitting kind of analysis to what you just laid out yeah. there. And I know with what we do in Business Owner Elevation, it is to help you guys move to the next level. And if you can take anything away just from that bit of bio from what Dwayne has broken down there, please do. Rob, where do you want to go next? <laughs> No, I like that. I like, so just a little bit about your routine because this journey, yeah, obviously of homelessness, and then so you're, you're, you're visualizing daily, yeah, <laughs> like momentarily, <laughs> momentarily, yeah, Moment at to least moments. every hour of my day, yeah, you know, this whole journey took me what was it, 642 Saturdays, uh, or something like that. That's how long it took me from the 27th of November 03 to be getting mm -hmm. that green light. You know, so does, did you hear that elevation nation? Yeah. The meticulous, meticulous counting, yeah. Yeah. and and you know this is why, especially at this this point, I want to just write there for the, for any parent that's got young teenagers who sometimes why this that your daydreaming daydreaming is important. Yeah, it's called manifestation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And I did I manif I manif I tried to manifest everything 
through visualization. I'm mm. a big believer in, you know, obviously speaking to the universe and bringing mm -hmm. what you, the energy you put out, you get back in. But yeah. one thing I did do before I booked the show, and I don't tell much people this, mm. but it sounds crazy, but it's the truth. You know, I was with a friend of mine in the States and, you know, most people in the States in the artistic industry are quite spiritual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I sat with them and was having a crazy, a crazy time. I think my auntie had just passed. And, um, or I, think, I don't think she passed yet. Something come to me and it changed my whole life. And I know it sounds very Gandhi-ish and God-ish and mm. Jesus-y, but I realised uh, at one point, or well, at that point, that the love is the answer. I know it sounds really crazy, it but doesn't, that, that's it, perfect. it hit me. And I, it, all my life I was like, rah! And then it hit me, I was like, oh my God, the answer is love. Mm. I mean, with everything, if you mm. make love the first step of your day and the last step of your day as you go into bed, I promise you, give it time and you will get everything you've ever wanted in your whole life. Karma, people think is a bad thing. Karma comes in many forms, including yeah. money. Mm. It's not a bad thing. I used to be bashful and be like, nah, it's not a bad thing. Money is, is a tool. Mm. It's not a machine to me. Yeah. It's just a tool yeah. Yeah. just to help whoever or whatever else. So I realized early on, love is the answer. And everyone's got their own angles to get to the, the top of the mountain. But mine was love. And from that day, everything I did was based around love. And then everything started to come for me. Everything. Just anything I ever wanted just started to come so much. But it was perfect because it was all slow motion. I didn't blow up in my 20s, early 20s, yeah, yeah. and didn't know what was up was down. Mine was all slow. Even now, it's still quite slow, and mm. everything's taking its time, and it's perfect for mm. me. I didn't want to blow in my 20s. I wasn't yeah. ready, yeah, yeah. you know, whatever. So, yeah, love is the answer, man. Cool, yeah. cool. Great answer. And, you know, I, I love what I'm hearing right now, Dwayne, because I think it's yeah. key. And even just to put it into a different context of business if you're in a business or doing a job that you don't love <laughs> there there is the answer guys and, and you don't even have to get spiritual about it it's like you can break it down to that that kind of basic level if you're in something or running a business or doing something that you don't love you're not going to get the results you want because you're not in it passionately and from to, to get to passion you need love and I think it's an, a really important step that you need in order to move to the next level. Like you say, you know, yeah. whether you, you reach the top of that mountain, you've got to have yeah. that as your foundation. Yeah. So I want to I wanna take you to our next question. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I know as part of your journey, you explained, uh, I would say, a number of failures, whether they're temporary or whatever, yeah? yeah. I, I would like to ask you, and, and the reason why we ask you this question is to, to really get to understand for our audience and everybody watching, you know, how did you get through the failure? So my question, Dwayne, is what's the biggest failure that you've gone through? Yeah. And what were the steps that you took to get past it or what you learned from it? The biggest failure I've gone through is, oh man, patience. Patience. Yeah. And patience to me is like passion that's been tamed. You know, you just... You got, you got. <laughs> That's a good one. No, for real. I, I felt like you just got. You got to just, you know, slap it and say, "I'm the daddy." You know, literally, you got to tame it because. Yeah. That's what that's what uh, drives a lot of people in my phone book or in my past to failure is ego. You know, yes. ego is for me is man's biggest killer. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and it can mess you up in ways you can't even imagine just because of your ego or whatever else. So I find just being patient because I've always I always look at myself and be like, no nah, man, I can do what he's doing. I can do what he's mm -hmm. doing. I'm like, why am I not doing it? Why am I not doing that? What's what's the difference between me and that was always going to be yeah. my downfall. You know, that was going to be my failure. Yeah. Um, just not being patient and. I guess just uh, taking time to sort of condition myself, you know, so to speak. So, yeah, I think that, and I never, I never once wrote myself off in terms of not being able to do what I wanted to do. I had a few people say, you know, oh, you know, come on now, we get it, you're like, but come back now, you know, come and live your mm. life. And cause when it was at a point where it wasn't going to happen, people were like, dude, you're looking thirty, man. Yeah. Like, you got no kids, you got no family, you got no uh, education, no qualifications and stuff like that. Yeah. And I was just like, I can't stop. I'm at the point of no return. So the press upon you, their limitations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And But I said to them, I said, I remember sit people down and I'd be like, look, I promise you, I promise you, one day this will make sense to you. It will make sense. And now, you know. <laughs> well done. <laughs> They're like, I need you to do it. I'm like, yeah. 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 <laughs> but no, it's all love, you know. I, yeah, they did course. that out of love. They didn't do because uh, They're just, you know, people... Mm -hmm. protecting me and, and care about me exactly. you know and I still here today you know so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I think I think failure um is uh is it, uh, sorry patience, patience is yes. my biggest failure which is which is which is yeah. which is the thing that I put on my yeah. latest Instagram learn yeah. to fall in love with patience mm -hmm. oh see 
yeah. you know, because it, yeah. is, it, it can mess you, it can mess you and throw you off, and, and yeah. sometimes slow is fast. Yeah. Because yeah. it's a, that, that period of patience is really like saying, I believe, like the universe is saying, you need to grow, you need to step up to another level. Yeah. Then things will, you know, yeah, doors will open. Yes. So I, I like that. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So you get the hybrid of the turtle and the hare. Yeah. You don't have to be one or the yeah. other. No, no, you're right, man. <laughs> Just take your time, and as you said earlier, you don't do a job you don't love because. Yeah. You know, we're all animals, animalistic behavior. Mm. We thrive in natural habitat, you yeah. know, as we do. If you're doing a job you don't love, I promise you, in the next 10 years, you're going to go cuckoo. Yeah. Your cheese is going to slide off your cracker, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I promise you, you're going to waste the cheese. No, 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 no. You want jam in your donut, bro. So you got you got to go what's natural to you. I always tell kids when I speak to a lot of young boys and young girls, you know, I'll be like, yo, for example, your tea or, you know, Katrina, what comes natural to you? What do you love doing effortlessly? I don't know. Drawing, illustration, mm -hmm. write books, write kids books, do it for life and you'll never work a day in your life and they'll pay you. <gasps> really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's what I did. I figured it comes natural to me. I haven't worked in 13 years. Obviously side jobs, but I mean, yeah. you know, I love my show. You know, NCIS is a great gig and the, the, the pressures are there, obviously, you know, you're on, the, the eyes are on me, but I do stand on my head. <laughs> nothing to me nothing to me because I do this yeah. so I own it protect it and it's mine I know? do this yeah. I like that man yeah. do it guys do Rob. it man <laughs> yeah. so uh, as you talk about this I mean obviously now I think NCIS is, is kind of like being broadcast in the UK that the new series is out yeah, now yeah. over here just just talk about that whole I know it's still fresh and it's still new but I'm sure I, I'm sure I've seen on, on Insta a couple of things that where you've been going to award shows and, and mm. different little things. So, what is it? I mean, what what is it like? A lot of are a lot of those actors, actresses, and people in the business kind of full of crap, or is there some real genuine people in there? Was it just, is Hollywood as we you know kind of see it from a thirty thousand foot view on the TV, like just pure madness going on behind the scenes? Well, life you're always gonna get that side mm -hmm. of the side. No matter where you go in life, mm -hmm. who you are, you're always gonna have to filter out. Uh, whoever and all of it is perception you know? mm. it's how you see things you know mm. and you know fortunately with my show they've been going for so long yeah. it's a machine you know I feel yeah, like a ghost yeah, in a machine because I'm, I'm just coming in like with this weirdness you know which, you know angle I'm taking on mm. it and it's working for me but my co-stars obviously are very you know they've all been in the game for years yeah, you know? yeah, they've, yeah. Done, they've done very well with themselves so they're at a point where they don't need an ego one of my first days on the set of NCIS when I was guest guesting still uh, I remember just going for dinner one day, uh, for lunch in the, mm -hmm. the, the cafeteria a bit, and this line is at least 30, 40 people long. And I see Mark Harmon, my, you know, grey-haired uh, fox, you know, the, the big guy yeah. on campus. Yeah. Everyone loves him, you know, crazy, successful guy. He went straight to the back of the line, 30, 40 people. And I'm looking around like, why is my mom going to the back <laughs> of the line? What, go and jump in the front. Yeah. And, but from that day, I realised there was no egos around me, and you didn't have to be... This Mr. Big I Am, yeah, you know. Yeah. So he, he was one of the mans that showed me, like, this guy makes, you know, more money than anyone knows to handle <laughs> a week. Yes. Mm. Not one time. This guy's stupidly peed off. And where I'm from, it's not, I try and, like, play, downplay it. Like, it's not a big deal. But it is a big deal. Yeah. It's stupid. And I'm sitting there every week, like, bro, these guys are really the real deal here. You know, he's one of the highest paid actors on television in history. You know, so I'm working with this guy every week and he's still at the back of the line. So things like that showed me that, you know, that you don't have to have an ego. Mm. And then again, there's other people, no disrespect to, who are doing other things that probably in that, that level. And they walk in on like they're Diana Ross or Prince yeah, or Michael yeah. Jackson, you know, <laughs> and there's no need for it. Yes. But as I said, it's ego. Yeah. It's that, you know, feeding, you know, uh, feeding whatever carries you, you know, mm -hmm. or what you think carries you. So, awesome. you know, you, you're going to get people, you know, and I've met some people who probably ain't, you know, look me in the eye, so to speak, but that's okay, man. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. You know, I just smile. And as my mom says, live good with everyone. And um, as I said, love is the answer. Yeah, That's absolutely. it for me, man. Cool. Thanks, thanks for that answer. Mm. Very insightful. Mm. So I've got, I've got a question, Dwayne. Yeah. Our audience is watching right now. And we refer to them as you probably heard Rob say, Elevation Nation. So yeah. that's Elevation Nation. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Love that. <laughs> Execute, elevate, and evolutionize your life. <laughs> <laughs> Triple E, baby. I love that. I love that. <laughs> so my question is, we've got young, we've got old, we've got in between listening, watching, what's the one thing that our community should be aware of right now, according to Dwayne's world? Uh, to do with me or just generally? Just anything, generally. 
Oh man, I say it a lot, but just ask. You know, instead of asking why, ask why not, man. It's that simple, you know. Mm-hmm. Just start being like, why? why? Just say why not. Yes. That changes the whole game, you know. For me anyway, it just flips things on their head. Mm-hmm. That why not will just keep you going there. Why not? Oh, what about that? Why not? It's just going to take you places yeah. you've never been, but why is just going to stump you, mm. you know? So just ask, you know, questions are open-ended, I think, and just, you know, that's the root of it. Forget what's happening on around you, you know? Everyone has a choice in this yeah. life. I've got many friends who are, you know, um, probably in the classroom with me, with you guys, yeah. who are, you know, in uh, in places they shouldn't be, mm-hmm. you know, but everyone has a choice. No one puts a gun to your head, you know, yeah. you know, so to speak, so... You have a choice. I don't want to hear it from anyone. I'm from Handsworth, from yeah. Lazales. My mom had me 15, 16, you know. I'm, I'm, you know, it doesn't get any more yeah. trailer trash yeah. black than that, does it? Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So to speak. So, you know, I just find like you can make a choice, but you got to drop the ego. Mm-hmm. You know, this bravado, you know, I have seen it around my friends, you know, this, you know, your four or five closest friends around you. They're the strongest representation of who you are or yeah. who you're going to be. So you need to just look around and think, has this person really got my back? Yeah, he's got my back if a man pumps me in my face. Cool. <laughs> but what about life? Yeah. What about protecting my daughter's daughter? You know, you're going to help me on a big scale. And I think 100 black men were the people that first showed me that you can have a foundation and be black, you know, because mm. I find as black people, we don't have as much organisation mm. as a lot of people. We don't organise crime. Mm. And that's what we're, you know, probably known by a lot of people around mm. the world to be involved in. We ain't even got organised crime. Yeah, yeah. I'd agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, what does that mean? Mm. You know? So, yeah, there's a lot of work to do, but, you know, hopefully I can um, just give people a little bit of an insight to uh, the why not and the answer at the end of why not. You know? There you go, Rob. Um, I'm sure Rob may have another question. I'm just yeah. reminding our, oh. our, our older friend here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got two questions, really. I've got one about, obviously, the business you're in, like now, because obviously you could get typecast or you can be like shows, but what is some of your goals in terms of your acting career? What kind of things would you like to do? Would you like to move off that and do big blockbuster movies? What kind of things, you know, what kind of characters would you like to play in the future? Yeah, or what, yeah. I believe, or I hope, I have faith that I have a couple of classics in me in my lifetime, ultimately, you know, the genre doesn't really matter to me at this point, as long as it's me telling the story and, you know, I'm bearing a piece of my soul that is truthful mm-hmm. and the audience get it, ultimately. Mm-hmm. I don't care what it is, but just, you know, forget the messenger for a minute and just listen to the message. Mm-hmm. You know, that's ultimately what I want to do. But yeah, obviously films is something that I want to get to because, mm-hmm. you know, I just love the process of filmmaking. Yeah. And TV's obviously great. Right yeah. like now TV's winning. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, kicking yeah. ass, Netflix, all these yes. things. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the business side of things, obviously, is just to, um, obviously, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a business product. I'm a package. Yeah. I'm a, you know, call it what you what you want, but I am a business product. So yeah. I've got to, you know, portray my package the best way I can. You know, yeah. I don't want you to just look at me on a shelf and keep moving. I want you to stop, take a couple steps back, Brand and have a look at me, open me up. You know, mm. and you know, I'm not just some flash in the pan, hopefully, or passing Ferrari because I've been doing this for too long mm. and it's gone so slow. I've been fortunate enough to appreciate everything and take it in my stride. And not only ride this unicorn, but get off it and <laughs> lay with it and, you know, brush it and mm-hmm. clean its horn. and <laughs> Literally, yeah, man, I, I, I'm doing this, you know. And as I said, this is my first gig in the States, first real gig. And I ain't even took my warm-up jacket off yet. Yeah. So I'm scared of what I'm going to do in the future because I, what I do, I know everyone does their thing, but what I do ain't no one messing with me on this planet mm. today on planet Earth. Nobody, zero. That's how, that's how I see it. Dominate. You're not, you're not, I'm not touching me. Yeah. And what I do. Mm-hmm. And you do, I'm fine. But Dwayne Henry, the man in the mirror, ain't no one messing with him. No. I'm my biggest competition. Me. No one else. So the world, you know, is my oyster. And, you know, I'm going to be dead for a lot longer than I'm going to be alive. And mm-hmm. it scares the shit out of me. Yeah. Excuse my language. Mm-hmm. So, so with that being said, you know, I've just got to keep pushing, man. And just mm-hmm. keep pushing out these shows and films. So one day... When our kids, kids, kids look back, they can see how we used to walk, you know, mm. a show called West 10 or like Don't Play Drama. They seen how their great granddad spoke and where he was from and see great granddad doing sh- uh, stuff on the other side of the pond mm. and making it look effortless. Yeah, you know, yeah. I think of the big picture, you know, granddad coming yes. from Jamaica in the 50s, whatever, on the Windrush and then going to England, you know, I'm second generation. And mm. what does that mean to me as a man? You know, yeah, all these absolutely. things go in my head yeah. and it's never going to stop. It's just constant, you know. 
A lot of parallels here. Isn't yeah, it? there is. There is. There is. And I've got another question before we go in. Before we we, we kind of wrap yeah, up, yeah. which is um, as we're around the table here, they're like the knights of the round table. <laughs> but um, if if you you know could invite three people to dinner, living or dead, who would those three people be, oh, and why? Man. Powerful question. I don't mm. know if I got a powerful answer. You got it. Um, you feel okay, it. <laughs> three people dead or alive. Mm. Oh my gosh. Okay, three people dead or alive. See, this is a hard one though. Not to come off powerful, try and be all dramatic. But when people say who do you want to meet, I honestly always say everyone, anytime, anywhere, any place, because mm-hmm. anyone, anywhere Sounds can like teach you anything. <laughs> you know, you could be having a bad day and you see like some kid with a lollipop, little girl with pigtails, smile at you. Change your whole day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to meet her. Yeah. I don't want to meet so and so. I want to meet her. Mm-hmm. So that's how I see things. But if you want me to answer it, I will answer it. Sidney Portier before he won the Oscar. Cool. Mm-hmm. That then must have been a crazy time for him, being mm-hmm. the only one in what he's doing. So I'd love yeah. to just pick his brain a little bit and you know, because people always forget to mention it. They mention the Denzels and all these cool cats, Absolutely. but Sidney Portier was the one who sort of, you know, took he kicked down the door and tore off the roof yeah. for a man like Denzel and Lawrence yeah. Fishburne and all these guys to get in. So maybe, you know, Sydney before the before the Oscar. Secondly, oh my gosh. Oh, right. Who would I like to be? <laughs> it's pressure time. Oh man. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Second person. Who would I like to be? Ever. Oh my gosh. This is a crazy one, man. I need a second. <laughs> Can I go to the third person? Where, where, where yeah. the time lapse? Okay, yeah. <laughs> the third person, no, no, like the second person would have to be. Oh my gosh, man. This is going to sound crazy and probably a little bit corny, but probably Nelson Mandela, day three, day four of prison. That when he just first got locked mm. up for those 20 odd years, whatever he did, mm. you know, just where his mind was and where mm. he said, you know, if he had hope of what everything was going to be at the end yeah, and just, yeah. just to just to hear his story and just to see that that conviction mm-hmm. that come out of his mouth something like that someone like something like that in that situation mm-hmm. and the third person me on my deathbed alright you, you know mm. it's quite interesting thank you for yeah. sharing that Dwayne is that every person he mentioned was at a point in time in their yeah. life yeah. and I really like that yeah. <laughs> you can tell he's an actor <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to know how the way carry yeah, yeah, that yeah. point yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. yeah. And, and you know what that's really cool because like you can you can feel the passion around what you do because yeah. the way you come across and you know the reasons why you yeah. want to meet someone mm. so thanks for asking mm. that again yeah, yeah. nice Rob. question man yeah. I never even thought of that but yeah, yeah. Nice. so uh, as Rob said as we're getting close to wrapping up I think before we finally wrap up, we're going to leave Dwayne with the final word. Yeah. I think as an actor, he will have the final word today. So generally the final word, we wrap up with, you know, a statement or something. And I'd love for you to share that with our audience. But the the question I want to ask you yeah. is if people want to find out more about Dwayne, brand Dwayne, yeah. you know, where should they be looking other than watching NCIS? <laughs> Friday at Fox, 9 o'clock. <laughs> no, uh, uh, I mean, I'm literally the publicity girls on NCIS. I think they hate me, man, because I, they actually forced, I had to get forced to get a Twitter and, okay. and a, you know, Instagram and mm-hmm. all these things. Mm-hmm. I have Facebook because of my family from back home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, can I just, can I just, can I, can I vent for a minute about Go social vent, media? Yeah, yeah. Right. exclusive. Let me take my watch off, man. I'm about to get all serious yeah. here. All right, no disrespect to anyone who's on social media who's made a living, a successful, you know, I want everyone to eat and live and mm-hmm. have a great, you know, technology mm-hmm. is the way forward. I do love it and I appreciate it and I, I get it. But things like Instagram have desensitized, and for me, this speaking for me, I don't know about anyone yeah, else, yeah, yeah. but it has ruined my view on women, mm-hmm. uh, you know, love, and just things like that, you know, it's so in my face right now, like beauty and, you know, the, the filters and the pretty, it, there's no, there's no element of surprise no more. I like, not saying I like to, I like to work for my meat. <laughs> as, a, as a man, you know, like a caveman mentality, you want to go out or you want to earn it. But if I can just type in and stri- uh, slide down and see everything but what you had for dinner, 
it's not like it's not it's, it's just ruined it for me when I was young because I'm like the last generation before phones and technology mm-hmm. when I was 13, 14 and I'd be walking on the street and I'd see like a little page three little tear out I'd be like raw look look at this little movies and whatever else <laughs> and that for me these kids don't have that yeah. they don't have that they can type in anything on YouTube and see everything they they they, yeah. they anything they can't even imagine yeah, exactly. you know so for me it's just ruined that whole you know the, the whole love letter uh, uh, mentality is mm. gone for me you know so from then I didn't want to, I didn't care about Instagram and stuff like that. I like organic stuff. Yeah, it's nice to meet girl online and stuff, mm. but I like meeting that girl in the supermarket who's checking if the potatoes got bruises in it. And I'm like, right, she's kind of cute. That's <laughs> real. That's natural for me. Yeah. So natural yeah. progression. This yeah. internet stuff, it's zeros and ones, man. Mm. You know, it might work for some people, but for me, I'm old school, man. I got old soul. You know, my ancestors speak to me on a daily basis through Dennis Brown's music, might I add. Mm-hmm. So I always listen to them and I know I've been here many times mm-hmm. and I'll probably come back in many different forms. That's how, how I see it. So for me, social media has just tarnished a lot of things, man, that I love. Mm-hmm. And I get it. It works for people and you need it in this day and age. You've got to work with the times. Yeah. I'm a yeah. big believer of staying Absolutely. with the hustle and adapting to your environment, you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Dwayne Henry, <laughs> uh, real Dwayne Henry is my Instagram. And my Snapchat is I am Dudzi, I A M D U D Z I. Facebook's just Dwayne Henry, and uh, no, sorry, my Instagram is Dwayne Henry official. See, I don't official. even know Dwayne Henry official. My in- my Twitter's <laughs> real Dwayne Henry, so you can catch me on any of those. Until next time, Elevation Nation visit www.businessownerelevation.com and keep soaring to new and higher heights of productivity and profitability.